Okay, welcome back. Um, in case you've forgotten, um, this is University Physics. We're in the fall of 2020. This is going to be chapter eight, part two. All right, we're going to try to finish up this chapter um, in this installment. Um, and so um, we're going to take what we what we did last time. And we're just going to change it, tweak it ever so slightly. So again, we're going to have an object um, on a surface with friction. Um, this time, however, we're going to apply a, a force, which is going to push this object across the surface. Um, we're still going to have um, our gravitational force, still going to have our contact or normal force, and we're going to have a kinetic frictional force. And um, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to push this across the surface along some uh, displacement vector D. And um, we're going to analyze the work and energy done uh, in, this, in this process. So, um, so let's, um, let's begin to uh, tease this apart, right? So um, if we look at Newton's second law in the vertical direction, we have that the normal force minus the gravitational force is zero, or that the normal force is equal to the gravitational force. Um, no, uh, no surprises there. <coughs> Excuse me. If we look in the uh, horizontal direction, we have the applied force minus the kinetic frictional force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. Now let's go and um, let's go and take a look at one-dimensional kinematics here. And make some um, make some analyses. So um, we know that V squared is equal to V naught squared plus 2A times D. That is, this object is going to have some uh, initial velocity in that direction. And um, you know, by the time it gets down to here, through that displacement, it's going to have a final velocity V. So um, let's solve for the acceleration here in this, in this expression. So um, this is going to be, um, this is going to be one half V squared minus one half V naught squared is equal to A times D. And then A then is going to be then one half V squared over D minus one half V naught squared over D. And then let's take this, let's throw that into there, all right? So we're gonna have FA minus the kinetic frictional force. It's gonna be the mass times one half, whoops, one half, one half V squared over D minus one half V naught squared over D. And I'll do two factorizations here, right? I'm gonna factor in N and I'll factor out D. So then this is gonna be equal to then one over D. So be one half M V squared minus one half M V naught squared. And I'll multiply both sides by D, and then this is going to be FA times D minus the kinetic frictional force times D. It's going to be equal to, and we'll recognize this as the change in the kinetic energy. All right. So um, what happens here is um, the following, right? So um, um, we talked the other day about, um, about um, what happens um, when we have a frictional force involved from an energy 
from an energy point of view, right? And so you know, we talked about rubbing our hands together and, um, and recognizing that, uh, recognizing that um, some heat was generated and the same deal is going to happen here. So, you know, as, as this object is moving across this, this friction the surface, right, we're going to have the generation of, of heat, you know, some of which is going to go into the block, some of which is going to go into the surface, some of which will, you know, go into the surrounding uh, air. And this will be, this will be a thermal, this will be a thermal energy, okay? Um, some heat. Now experiment has shown, experiment has shown that the thermal energy is directly related to um, the work done by friction. As a matter of fact, the thermal energy that's generated is actually equal to the work done by friction. And so, so here's the work done by friction, okay? This is the work done by friction. And you know it has the negative sign because of the relationships between the, the kinetic friction vector and the displacement vector. And so we can move that to the other side of the equation. And then we get that the work done by the applied force then is going to be equal to the change in the kinetic energy plus the work done by frictional force and magnitude. And we just stated that that could be that could be um, that could be equal or that that's equal to then the thermal energy involved thermal energy involved in, in this process of the frictional force occurring at the interface of, of this, of this uh, block and surface, okay? So, so now um, we've got this new kind of energy, this thermal energy, which is related to um, the uh, work done by the frictional force, okay, in magnitude. So let's, um, let's, let's take one more comprehensive example, right? And so um, we're going to look at, we're going to look at an object, which again has an applied force this time it's moving up an incline of some angle theta. So we still have a gravitational force. Right? We still have a contact or normal force. And we're gonna have a kinetic frictional force. Okay, and we're gonna have um, an angle of incline here, which is gonna be called theta. And um, you know what we've done in the past, right? This is familiar territory for you is that we resolved, we resolved the gravitational force into two components, the mg cosine of theta. This one's going to be mg sine of theta. Right? This force is no longer there. And now that, let's employ the work kinetic energy theorem for this. Okay, so we're going to move this block through some uh, displacement D along this incline. And let's take a look now. Let's take a look at the work involved um, in these, um, these forces. Okay, so um, you will recall that the uh, work kinetic energy theorem, which is your next the best friend next to uh, Newton's second law, stated that work net is equal to the change in the kinetic energy. Now work net was the work done by all of the forces involved, right? So this is the work done by the gravitational force, the work done by the contact or normal force, the work done by the applied force, and in this particular case, the work done by the kinetic frictional force equal to the change in the kinetic energy. Now, 
what's familiar to you or what should be familiar to you is that if we, um, if we looked at, right, if we looked at the work done by the, the normal force and the work done by the cosine component of the gravitational force, right, by virtue of those two forces being perpendicular to the displacement vector, they do no work. And so we, we should write that down. Okay, so the work done by the normal force and the work done by the cosine component of the gravitational force, they're both equal to zero because they're perpendicular to the displacement vector. Okay, all right. So, um, so um, again, what we, I guess what we should say, maybe, maybe I should write this down maybe a little bit more carefully, right? So it's zero uh, because, because mg cosine theta and fn are perpendicular to the displacement vector. Okay, and that's a little bit more exact. And if you're going through this later, um, it, uh, it won't be that confusing to you, okay? So, um, so the only component that does work here then is the work, is the work done by mg sine of theta, which then is gonna be the magnitude of that force, which is mg sine of theta times the displacement magnitude times the cosine of theta prime. Now, theta prime is the angle, is the angle, the angle between mg sine of theta component and the displacement vector. And so theta prime in this case is 180 degrees. And so the work done by mg sine of theta is going to be equal to mg sine of theta. Now, theta here is the angle of the incline, right? Times the displacement vector and magnitude times the cosine of 180 degrees, which is negative one, which is negative mg sine of theta times d. Okay, and that should that should all be familiar to you, right? So now let's get a little bit more elegant, right? Let's get a little bit more elegant here. And so um, let's go back to, to um, the uh, dot product representation of the work. And so the work done by the gravitational force then is gonna be the gravitational force dotted into the displacement vector, okay? And so then that's going to be the magnitude of the gravitational force, the magnitude of the displacement vector times the cosine of the smallest angle between those two vectors. All right now, I'm going to redraw, I'm going to redraw this. Right, so here's, here's our block. Here is the gravitational force. Okay, and here is the displacement vector. Okay, and the smallest angle, the smallest angle between them is this theta prime, which I want you to recognize is very different than the angle of incline. All right, so let me draw in a perpendicular here to the displacement vector. So this is 90 degrees. And you'll notice, right? You'll notice that um, this is theta. We've proven that um, many times before. And so you know now that theta prime is going to be 90 degrees plus theta, looking at that, right? So again, this is this is 90 degrees. And so theta prime is going to be 90 plus theta. And so then cosine, cosine of theta prime is going to be the cosine of 90 degrees plus theta. 
And if you remember your trigonometric identities, right? So we have the cosine of alpha plus beta is going to be the cosine of alpha times the cosine of beta minus the sine of alpha times the sine of beta, which means now that the cosine of 90 degrees plus theta is going to be the cosine of 90 degrees, the cosine of theta minus the sine of 90 degrees times the sine of, of theta. Okay. So the cosine of 90 degrees is zero. Okay. The sine of 90 degrees is negative one times the sine of theta. Okay, so the first term is zero. Sine of 90 is negative one. Hang on here. So, uh, no, sorry, the sine of 90 is plus one. Jesus. Sine of 90 is plus one. We inherit this negative sign from, um, from the identity, okay? And so we get that the cosine of 90 degrees, 90 degrees plus theta is equal to the negative sine of theta, where theta now is the angle, the angle of the incline. Okay? All right. So now let's look at this, let's look at this dot product again. All right. So then we have the work done by the gravitational force is going to be equal to the gravitational force times the magnitude of displacement B, right, times the cosine of the smallest angle between them, which is theta prime. But theta prime, right, cosine of theta prime, right, so the cosine, and it's the cosine of theta prime, which is the cosine of 90 degrees plus theta is equal to negative sine of theta. So then this becomes the negative sine of theta. And then this equals then mg times d times um, negative sine of theta. Right, so I'll put the negative sign out front, it's the sine of theta. So you'll notice, you'll notice that, that this, that this is the same as this, okay? So then the work done by the gravitational force, right, can be written nearly as this, and then we can just write work done by gravitational force instead of looking at the work done by the components in particular. Okay. So now back to the work, back to the work kinetic energy theorem, right? What did we have? We had the work done by the gravitational force plus then the work done by the normal force, the work done by the applied force, the work done by the kinetic frictional force is equal to the change in the kinetic energy. Okay, so we can leave the work done by the gravitational force just as it is, right? And the dot product will take care of, of any components involved there. This we already reasoned was zero, all right? We can recall a couple of things, right? That the work done by the gravitational force is the negative change in the gravitational potential energy. So we can actually make that substitution. So then this would be the negative change in the gravitational potential energy plus the work done by the applied force plus negative F of K times D, right? Is equal to the change in the kinetic energy. Now you know where that came from, right? So the work done by the kinetic frictional force was the magnitude, the magnitude of the kinetic frictional force times the magnitude of the displacement 
times the cosine of the smallest angle between the, the, the kinetic frictional force and the displacement vector. So if we go back to this diagram, okay, and if we now put in the gravitational, gravitational friction force, and if we look at now the smallest angle between those, so that's going to be theta double prime, and that's 180 degrees. So, so now this then becomes the work done by the kinetic frictional force. It's going to be the kinetic frictional force times the magnitude of the displacement vector times the cosine of 180 degrees. And that now is going to be negative Fk times D, which is what we have in this expression, okay? So now we're gonna move things to the other side. So we have the work done by the applied force. It's gonna be the change in the kinetic energy plus the change in the gravitational potential energy. We called this, right, the change in the thermal energy right, from above, right? We already went through that example. So now, to, to, to totally wrap this up, right, to put a ribbon on it, right, if, if, if springs are present, if, string, if springs are present, then we know that the work done by the spring force is equal to the negative change in the elastic potential energy. And, and that, would be, that would be on this side. Right? So if there were springs present, then we would have the negative change in the elastic, right? The elastic potential energy, because then that would be the work done by the friction force. The work, the work done by the work done by the uh, gravitational force, which is the negative change in the gravitational potential energy. The work done by the applied force minus Fk times D, the work done by the frictional force, that would be the change in the kinetic energy. Right? So now let's tidy this up just a bit, moving, uh, moving these energies to the other side. When we have the work done by some applied external force then, it's gonna be equal to the change in the kinetic energy plus the change in the gravitational potential energy, plus the change in the elastic potential energy, okay? Um, plus the change in the thermal energy from friction. This now is our final statement of the law of conservation, conservation of energy. It basically says that the work done by any external force is gonna be equal to the change, total change in these energies, right? If, if we have no, no external force, then we have no work done, right? Then the work done by some external force of zero. And so we have zero is equal to the change in the kinetic energy plus the change in the gravitational potential energy plus the change in any elastic potential energy plus the change in any thermal energy. And this is the most comprehensive statement we can have because um, basically it says that that the changes in all of the energy must sum to zero. Right? Energy can't be created or destroyed. It just can be parceled back and forth between these forms. And so that the total change, again, given no external forces acting on our system, okay, then, then, then the, the sum of the changes in the energy will sum to zero. And then that is now going to be the law, of, you know, another, another uh, interpretation of the law of conservation of energy. Okay, 
So I have uh, just a couple of tidbits to tie up, but this is a good place. Um, this is a good place to um, to end at least this part of the discussion. Um, when we get back, I'll uh, talk about um, talk about power, which will take about five or ten minutes, and then we'll move into chapter nine. Okay, very good. Good luck, guys. Enjoy the weather. <laughs>